The launch of a new platform is an exciting time, but for me, the launch of the Super Famicom is touched with sadness. For the past 708 days, I've been chronicling the Famicom one game at a time. And at this point, I'm over seven years into the chronology of the system. It had its rocky launch, a boom, it's survived multiple competitors, and in 1989, Nintendo themselves released a second 8-bit platform. Despite its age, the system had been doing pretty well for itself. But November 21st, 1990 marks the beginning of the end for the system. It's not an instant turnover. There is one more year in which everyone tries to get their last Famicom games out the door. But by the end of 1991, the Super Famicom has become the dominant system in Japan. And so the Famicom's days are numbered. The Super Famicom was long delayed. Nintendo wanted to have it out for the 1989 holiday season. That delay let Nintendo get it right, though. And the Super Famicom was just an enormous leap over the existing system. The transition for developers over to the Super Famicom was extremely rapid as well. Which brings me to this video. I release an episode a day chronicling the progress of the Famicom, and looping in the Super Famicom would be a bit much. But I still want to take a look at what everyone else was doing as the Famicom was winding down. And so this video is the first year and one day of Super Famicom games. I tacked on the extra day because on the first anniversary there was a major release. I'm going to take a brief look at the 38 games that made up the Super Famicom's first year, and we'll be able to see where gaming was going in 1990. Just like with my Fami Daily episodes, I'm playing on original, unmodified hardware with real cartridges, though in a few cases here I'm playing the US version. It was just what I had available. Okay, enough preamble. We're here for the games, let's get to them. Let's get things started with the game that sold people on the Super Famicom. I'm not saving the best for last this time, though partially that's because there's only two launch games. Super Mario World was the true follow-up to Super Mario Bros. 3, and Super Mario Bros. 3 was more popular than you could imagine. For over a year after its release, stores couldn't keep copies on the shelf, and Super Mario World came just two years later. It has the same world map, the same style of power-ups, the same level design philosophies. The label of the Japanese cart even says Super Mario Bros. 4. Super Mario World was more of everything that players wanted. And it finally added a battery save so you didn't have to sit there for four hours like you did with Super Mario Bros. 3. That dedication to following in Mario 3's footsteps is also its greatest weakness, though. Yeah, Super Mario World is more colorful, and the stages are bigger, and there's more of them. But there's not a lot mechanically different. The rideable dinosaur Yoshi was a holdover from Mario 3 that they couldn't quite get to work on the Famicom. But most of the rest of the game feels like something that you could have seen on that system. It's one of the greatest platformers of all time, but it's also definitely a launch title that doesn't push the system particularly hard. Of course, one of the most obvious new features of the Super Famicom was the Mode 7 graphics. It allowed for scaling and free rotation of an image on a plane. In the early days of the Super Famicom, developers were heavily encouraged to include some specific Mode 7 feature for their game. And in Nintendo's case, their showcase launch title for the effect was F-Zero. Every track in this hovercraft racing game was one large image that gets distorted to give players a behind-the-car perspective. It's an effect that would be copied a lot by people, especially with racing games. But besides being a tech demo for their new graphics features, F-Zero showed off how fast the system could get. The game featured some blazing speed, almost too fast for players, and losing control could send you pinballing around the track. There's a ton of races as well, with multiple cups, each consisting of five tracks, and four different vehicles you could drive. F-Zero could have just been a quick demonstration of the technology of the Super Famicom, but Nintendo turned it into something special. It'll be imitated a lot, but very few will be able to come close to its quality. 
Ten days after the Super Famicom's launch, we have its first third-party title. Bomboozle is also known as Kablooey overseas, and it's a game that feels like it didn't need the new system. It's a very basic puzzle game of the kind that we've seen a lot of on the Famicom, and has been relatively popular on the PC Engine. Yeah, the visuals have a little bit more color to them, but the game itself doesn't expand on what's possible. Your goal on every stage of Bomboozle is to blow up all of the bombs. Bombs that you detonate will set off bombs next to them, and they'll destroy tiles underneath them. And larger bombs will explode in a larger radius, and you could get caught up in that. So the trick is that you have to figure out a path that will let you detonate bombs, but not become trapped yourself. I've always found this one to be visually muddy. The angle and how close in size the different types of bombs are to each other makes it hard for me to know where I can stand safely. And sorting out that visual noise is really the only difficult part of these puzzles. We're going to see a lot of all-time classics and innovative games as I go through this first year, and Bomboozle stands out for being the worst non-sports game for that first year of the Super Famicom. I've never been able to get into Populous. Well, I say that, but there was a few weeks after I got this version where I just kept playing it and got to about level 500 before I decided to stop. I didn't play all 500 levels. You advance a certain number of levels depending on how well you do. So I skipped a whole bunch of them. I gave up when I realized that the game was the same thing over and over again. You flatten out terrain so that your people can build up their population. Then, once you have enough flat terrain so that there's a whole bunch of castles on it, you start snowballing up your divine power. Your ultimate goal is to genocide the other tribe that follows a different god. And by building up that divine power, you could unleash disasters upon them. Usually what I did was build my own people on high ground, and then flood the world a few times to drown everyone else. And once you have a significant numerical advantage, you could just declare Armageddon whenever you like, and send everyone off to a giant battle in the middle of the map. What Populous came down to was just a game of leveling out terrain a lot. And so, unlike another god game that we're going to see in a few minutes, there wasn't a whole lot to do once you got that down. At least the Super Famicom version has a lot of fun tile sets, including one where all of the buildings are different consoles. Now we're getting experimental. Actorizer is the classic merger of an action platformer with city management. And the thing everyone walks away from it with is, well, the action's okay, but I really loved building that city. When you're building it out, you have to defend your people against regular monster attacks and guide them to building the best city possible because that's how you get more power. You start each region with an action segment where you tame it enough that people can live there, then you build it up and in the process solve the problems of the people who live there, before some new crisis comes to a head and you have to go out and fight another action stage. The action is fine, it's a little bit stiff, and often the best approach is to just trade blows with the stronger enemies, but the real magic here is in that city construction phase, which would be why they eliminated it when they made the sequel one of the most baffling game design decisions of all time. Now it's not as good of a city builder as another one the Super Famicom will get soon, but it was still something special. Gradius 3 marks another series moving over from the Famicom to the Super Famicom. Konami's entrance to the platform is an arcade port, though to be honest I've never seen a Gradius 3 arcade machine in my life. The game continues the usual Gradius formula of shooting down waves of enemies, collecting the capsules they leave behind, and spending those on power-ups. The Super Famicom port is kind of infamous for its slowdown, though I found it made the game much easier. This was actually the first Gradius game that I could beat. It looks good, has a huge variety of environments, and I think it plays better than the 8-bit versions, even with the slowdown. The big effects on the stages really showcase the extra power that the Super Famicom had. You didn't see effects like this even on the PC Engine. 
which was practically the home of the shoot 'em up genre at the time. Gradius 3 is spectacle, through and through. Unfortunately, 1990 was kind of hitting the tail end of the golden age of the shoot 'em up, so the Super Famicom never got too many of them. And the very first shoot 'em up on the platform is one of the best ones on it. I gotta say, I've never liked Pilot Wings. Now, I think the sequels are great, but this first one is a Mode 7 tech demo strapped into a flight simulator that really doesn't work very well. I think my biggest problem with Pilot Wings is that because it's dependent upon Mode 7 scaling and rotation for the terrain, it's all flat as a pancake. There's no texture or depth on anything. The closest you get are the rings that you have to go through. The game puts you into several different flying vehicles, a biplane, a jetpack, a hang glider, and a parachute, and then challenges you to do certain tasks accurately and land safely. The flight model is simple, but that's fine for this kind of game. Pilot Wings for the Super Famicom is broken up into a series of stages, and every stage has a set of challenges in particular vehicles that it'll let you do in any order. You have to score a certain number of points overall before it will let you continue. Later on, there's some action-themed stages where you have to fly a helicopter through flat cannons. I know there's a lot of people with fond memories of this one, but I just can't get past how bare-bones and empty everything in Pilot Wings is. Everyone is disappointed by this port of Final Fight. Here's how it worked. You'd go into a store, see the box, and go, Final Fight? I love playing that game in the arcade with my friends, and now we can play it at home? And then you'd get it home, and discover that it was a single-player game. Capcom's Super Famicom debut really stripped down their arcade hit a lot. Besides reducing it to a single player, it also removed one of the three playable characters. But despite how reduced it is, it's still not a horrible port. It's got most of the enemies that you'd expect, and the characters who are there replicate the arcade feel pretty well. In December of 1990, this was the best beat-em-up you could get for a home console. About the past five years of Famicom games at this point haven't been able to keep pace with the arcade, and while Final Fight for the Super Famicom doesn't manage that, it's still a lot closer than anything Famicom players were seeing. We've reached our first Super Famicom exclusive, though unlike the Famicom and the NES, there is no hardware difference between the Super Nintendo and the Super Famicom. Just the shape of the cartridge slot. The Great Battle is part of the Compati Heroes series, games that we've already seen on the Famicom that mashed together a few different franchises that Bandai had the license to. Typically, Gundam, Ultraman, and Kamen Rider. The Great Battle series puts them into action games, and some of those are pretty good, but not this one. The first Great Battle game is an overhead run-in gun where you can switch between characters using the R and L buttons. The only real difference between the characters is the shape of their attack. This one's pretty slow, clunky, and dull to play. It's tough to maneuver around enemies, and jumping between platforms is probably the toughest boss in the game. Mon Presto has a reputation for mediocrity, and the great battle is really living down to that. We've entered 1991 with the first sports game for the Famicom. And I hate to break it to you, but there's going to be quite a few in this video. This is the second golf game using the likeness of Jumbo Ozaki that HAL has published, and HAL were actually the ones who developed the original Golf on the Famicom, so they have a long pedigree of golf games on consoles. That said, there isn't a whole lot new here. There's only one course, and the game modes are what you'd expect from a golf game in 1991. The graphics are better, and I feel like the modeling of the ball and its behavior is a lot better. But looking back at it 30 years later, it's hard to get too enthusiastic about this one. I'm not even sure if I would call it the best console golf game to that point, just because in 1991 there were a lot of console golf games out there. Still, if you got yourself a Super Famicom and you wanted to play golf, this game would have satisfied you. 
Jalico's first Super Famicom game is a racing game. It replicates the Paris-Dakar Rally, the long rally race through North Africa. Well, they don't use the name, and they completely skip over the European legs even though they show the race starting in Paris. The controls on this one feel a bit rough since you accelerate with X and brake with B, and then you shift up and down with the D-pad. It feels a bit uncomfortable. One aspect of the race is that you have parts break down during the legs, and you have to either carry spares with you, or you have to call in your support vehicle for repairs. Naturally, both of those will make you lose time. The big gimmick of Jalico Rally is that there's a lot of environmental hazards that you encounter. You might find the sun setting and you have to race after dark, or a sandstorm kicks up as you cross the Sahara. One problem I notice is that the hitboxes of other cars are very poorly defined. I was passing through a lot of people. When you finish a leg, your leftover time is applied to the next leg. I haven't really played Jalico Rally too deeply, but my feeling is it's a second tier racing game that picked up a bit of attention just by being the first auto racing game on the Super Famicom. I like the Darius series, but Darius Twin has always been my least favorite one of them. Maybe it's the bullet sponge enemy on the first stage that shoots the giant waves that destroy you even through shields. You make a bad impression on the first stage, it's hard to carry on. But Darius Twin does a lot of things right. It's a fast-paced shooter, faster than any that I think show up on the Super Famicom. It also gives players a lot of options to mitigate the difficulty, adding more lives and having an additional difficulty setting. The game also has an auto-fire option for you, which I am taking advantage of here. One of the things I appreciate here is that when you die, you don't lose your power-ups. You find the power-ups by killing certain formations of enemies, of course, because power-ups are permanent, it does mean that they tend to be a bit sparse. And since this is a Darius game, they do warn you that a huge battleship is approaching. The best thing in this game is the twin in that title. This is the first console Darius game that allowed for two-player simultaneous action. So while this isn't my favorite Darius game, it does have its good points. Yep, it's another golf game. Haru Kanaru Golf is a bit different, though, because it has the license of an American golf course, plus the Masters series. The title essentially means Far Away Augusta. This is also a port of a computer game, and that computer game was a knockoff of another more popular computer golf game. I don't know if that counts as a pedigree, but it's something. You can still see pieces of the computer interface design with these fake windows. The big thing about this game, besides using a real-world golf course, is that it renders that course in 3D. Okay, you get one frame every two seconds, roughly, but this technology was a big deal at the time, which would be why TND Soft copied it from Jack Nicholas Golf. Still, it's the first 3D game on the Super Famicom. These kinds of slow-rendering polygonal graphics were something that people were experimenting with a lot at the time. And this isn't the only one we're going to see in this video. Very nice of the box to tell us everything we need to know here. Ultraman is the most famous hero in Japan. He is from Nebula M78 for maintaining the peace of Earth. This marks Bondi's official entrance to the Super Famicom, although Bond Presto is one of their divisions, so they've already had one game. And naturally, it's a game based on a popular license. Ultraman is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game, and it is a rough one to play. Street Fighter 2 had only been out in arcades for about two months at this point, so the lesson of this is how fighting games are supposed to work hadn't had time to reach consoles yet. You've got a button for jump, a button for kick, a button for punch, and a button for special attacks. You're going to want to stick primarily to jump kicks because that's the most effective attack. You've got an energy meter that's building up over time, and as it passes each threshold, a new attack becomes available. You have to cycle through which ability you're going to use, and using a special attack makes that energy go away. Unfortunately, you have to have this meter full when the enemy runs out of energy in order to fire your final attack. And both you and your enemy recover health over time. So often the end of a match is you waiting for your meter to build up. It's not a well thought out system, 
and the fighting is as stiff and rubbery as what you'd see on TV. But would you really expect greatness from Bondi? Now you might be asking yourself, did he load up an old save from the person who originally had this cartridge and then unleashed a bunch of disasters on the city? And to that I say, yeah, of course I did. The Super Famicom port of SimCity takes one of the all-time classics of computer games and basically remakes it into something even better. All of the basic building blocks are still here. You build your city out of residential, commercial, and industrial zones, deal with basic services like providing power and roads, and then try to make your city grow. The Super Famicom version introduced a lot of features that would wind up being incorporated into later games in the series, like the density of your zoning and how it increases over time, how certain zones can merge together, and specialty zones that are used for rewards. Unfortunately, there's a bit of an infamous bug with SimCity for the Super Famicom, where you cannot get the final reward except on one map. And even on that map, to get it, you have to build a perfect city. My only real problem with this version of SimCity is that there's no mouse support. But they've added so much to it that it's become the definitive version of the original SimCity to play. They put the space in the title, not me. Super Professional Baseball brings us Tosei's debut. Well, the debut that we're pretty confident in. Tosei had their fingers in a lot of stuff, so it's always possible that they were behind one of the earlier games. And it's our first baseball game. There will be more. Jalico chose to not bring over the Moero Pro Yaku brand to the Super Famicom, but this is still Moero Pro Yaku moved to the Super Famicom. It plays the exact same as most baseball games that we've seen on the Famicom. The only thing this brings to the table is improved graphics. I guess there's also the fact that it was first, beating even Namco to the system. It's still the exact same baseball game that you've seen dozens of times, though. The Super Famicom has its very first RPG, and everyone kind of wishes it didn't. Draken was originally a computer game that was released by European publisher Infogrom. The most interesting thing about it is the polygonally drawn world. Those aren't Mode 7 graphics. But when you have an encounter or go inside a building, your party breaks apart and you control each member individually. Except in combat when they all just kind of wander around and stab. Draken is rather infamous for giving you no direction and being packed with easy ways to die. Wander off into the wrong direction, and you're probably dead really fast. You can even die from accidentally brushing up against a little bit of water. And if you wander around at night, the stars themselves attack you. This is a game of arbitrary cruelty toward the player. One where you just have to retry until you figure out what the game wants you to do. It's an intensely frustrating experience to try to play it. I doubt that Draken would have gotten any attention at all except it was the first Super Famicom RPG. A few days after Draken, the Super Famicom gets its first Japanese RPG. Gidlin, and no, that's not a typo, is based on a science fiction novel. If the game's style looks familiar to you, that's because it's based on the novel's illustrations, which were drawn by the person who did a lot of the design work for Fantasy Star. The game is also set in the same world as Famicom games Minervaton Saga and Silva Saga. Kidlin isn't remembered as a particularly bad RPG, but also not a very good one. What people really remember about it is that critical hits do 12 times as much damage. That's for both you and enemies. And as a result, battles become very swingy in it. Kidlin is mainly remembered as an Eh, it's fine, kind of game. No one's really passionate for it, but it did sell a lot of copies just due to being in the right place at the right time. It must have been the season for RPGs. Ease is the first big RPG franchise to make the jump to the Super Famicom, though there's also a Famicom port for this one. Since it originated on computers, Ease 3 got ported everywhere. In 1991, Nihon Falcom was still solely a computer game publisher, 
but by the time the Super Famicom era ends, they will be publishing their own titles on consoles. East 3 was a huge departure for the series. The first two games featured the same engine, which was a top-down view and had combat where you bumped into enemies to defeat them. East 3 switches things up with a side view and a much more action-orientated focus. Not that the previous Ease games were short on action, but now you actually have to hit a button to swing your sword. Although it does auto-fire if you hold the button down. The side view makes Ease 3 the black sheep of the family, but I've always had a bit of a soft spot for it. I know it's not the best, but I've had fun with it. Most of the console baseball games from around 1990 were just copies of Namco's Family Stadium. Super Stadium might be one of the more blatant ones. This looks like Family Stadium right down to the character proportions. Beyond that, it's a very bare-bones baseball game. If you choose to play the pennant race, the games are already predetermined, and you have to select which teams in the games you'll be playing as. For the on-field action, I often found the perspective to be a little bit off. Usually in this style of game, there's an assumed directly overhead view, which isn't realistic, but it lets players know exactly where they are. Super Stadium seems to be leaning more into an angled view, and as a result, I often feel like my fielders aren't standing where I think they are. I've played a lot of these early baseball games at this point, and Super Stadium just feels mediocre to me. Into every console, some Gundam must fall. And unfortunately, Kido Senshi Gundam F91 Formula Senki 0122 is not one of the rare good Gundam games. This one's a strange hybrid action strategy game. You start out on a strategic map guiding your troops around, and it's not really a turn-based combat so much as real-time but continuously paused. You hold down a button to make time advance, and then can release it to give orders. There's really only one unit that you're in direct control of, and when it comes into contact with the enemy, you start a very complicated action sequence. Really, you're supposed to be watching the radar in the lower right, and then when the enemy is in your firing arc, you can choose a weapon. The attacks and defense in this action mode are the only positive things about the game, as they go into some very elaborate animations to show the results. But that means the top half of the screen is useless, since it's there only to play animations that you don't have any control over, and the strategy aspects of the game are really shallow. I guess this one at least does the bare minimum of giving Gundam fans something to buy on the Super Famicom. It might not seem like it, but there really is a difference between the good and bad baseball games of the time. There's a different feeling in how it controls, how the game flows, the features that are there. And I'm mentioning this because Super Ultra Baseball's actually a good one. You could call it a sequel to the Famicom game Chojin Ultra Baseball, but really the only significant difference is the graphics, so maybe it's more of a remake. In the US, both of them use the exact same title, Baseball Simulator 1000. So perhaps it's best to think of them as two versions of the same game. Besides the baseball itself playing pretty well, the fun thing in Super Ultra Baseball is if you take certain teams, they have superpowers. There's a common pool of points that everybody on the team uses, so regardless of who uses the abilities, whether it's a pitcher, batter, or fielder, it costs the whole team a few points. This works really well in multiplayer, too, as both players try to figure out the exact right moment to use those abilities. The original version of the Famicom was one of the better baseball games of 1989, and this is the best baseball game of the Super Famicom's first year. If you love the slowdown in Gradius 3, get ready for Super R-Type. This game that's half a port of R-Type 2 and half its own thing, features just about the worst slowdown in the Super Famicom's first year. And that is saying something. The big feature of R-Type is that pod that attaches to the front of your ship, and as you collect power-ups, it changes what it fires. The pod's invulnerable, so it can take shots for you, or be launched into enemies and you can attach it to the front or back of your ship as required. Super R-Type is an extremely difficult game, even without the slowdown that reduces the game to a slideshow. 
There aren't any checkpoints on stages, so any death sends you all the way back to the beginning. And enemies can drop in on you from anywhere. That's probably why the game defaults to easy difficulty. It's just too hard for players if they didn't do that. They also added an auto-fire button so that you can shoot rapidly, but because your gun can charge, you don't want to rely on it. I like the R-Type games, but I've always found Super R-Type to be a troubled port. R-Type deserved a better port than this. Gunbare Golmon may have started as an arcade game, but it found its shape on the Famicom, and it was on the Super Famicom where it really became something special. Ganbare Goemon Yukihime Kyushutsu Emaki is the first of four Goemon games on the Super Famicom, and it sets the new standard for the series. You still have the kind of three-quarters view free-roaming areas. These are places where you can buy power-ups and equipment, play minigames, and advance to the next stage. But every level is anchored by a side-scrolling portion. And these platforming areas are rarely as straightforward as go to the right and hit A to jump every once in a while. There's some really spectacular screen-filling bosses as well, literally in the case of one boss who grows every time you hit it. I think Gunbare Golmon is the best action game the Super Famicom sees in its first year, and it's actually got some tough competition for that spot. But there's an enormous variety of things to do in the game, and I think it integrates some of the gimmicks of the Super Famicom a lot better than other games do. The base experience is very similar to what you'd find on a Famicom, but the gameplay has been expanded by taking advantage of the power of the Super Famicom. Now here's the RPG everyone has been waiting for. Strangely enough, Final Fantasy IV was originally previewed and advertised as Final Fantasy V, and that was with no Final Fantasy IV announced. The reason for that was that there were going to be two games released very close together, a Final Fantasy IV on the Famicom and Final Fantasy V on the Super Famicom. But that stretched Square's resources very thin, and so only one of the games was released. Since I've been playing through all of the Famicom games, at this point I've been through Final Fantasy 1 through 3, plus dozens of other RPGs, and I've got to say, Final Fantasy IV is actually kind of backwards. This is Final Fantasy trying to be Dragon Quest. The complex mechanics have all been stripped out. It's just characters who have individual abilities that unlock as they level up, and heavily scripted story sequences, similar to how Dragon Quest 3 and 4 played. It's an enormous step backwards for the series. And if it wasn't for the color palette, Final Fantasy IV could have easily been just another Famicom RPG. I can't say it's my least favorite of the sprite-based Final Fantasies, but it's close. I think the fact that there's two Compati Hero games in the Super Famicom's first year is a testament to how quickly Bon Presto was cranking these things out. Fortunately, they stopped it too. Battle Dodgeball is a clone of Niketsu Koko Dodgeball Boo, known in the West as Super Dodgeball. You pick a team from several different franchises, Ultraman, Gundam, Kamen Rider, and in this case I'm playing as the Mazinger team. Then you have a button to throw the ball at somebody, a button to defend, and a button to jump. Your goal is to keep hitting the opposing team with that ball, that reduces their hit points, and you want to knock them all out before you're knocked out. If you manage to win a match, then you can upgrade your character's stats, You'd think that all of this would extend the concept of the dodgeball game, but the action doesn't flow very well, and the controls feel a bit clunky. That said, Bon Presto did make a direct sequel to this one, so maybe that's a bit better? Capcom isn't known for their shoot-em-ups, but they really hit a home run with this one. The game took its inspiration from a comic about a group of mercenary pilots, and it was initially an arcade game. You're given your choice of three characters, each of whom has a starting plane that performs a little bit differently from each other, and then you're given your choice of different missions. The missions are your shoot 'em up stages, and you're given cash for completing these missions, which you then use to buy better equipment. As you're taking these missions, enemy forces are closing in on your base, and so you'll have to engage in battles to prevent them from reaching you. 
You can write up cash by taking some of the repeatable missions, but you're risking a game over if another force reaches you. While the action in the stages tends to be a little slower paced than a lot of shoot 'em ups, Area 88 lacks the slowdown that plagued the other shoot 'em ups of the Super Famicom's first year. I think it is a relatively easy shoot 'em up, but that also makes it kind of approachable. The Super Famicom never did get a whole lot of shoot 'em ups for it, and Area 88 is one of the standouts of that limited group. Yep, it's another baseball game. Combo League comes to us from Sony, back in the day when they were just getting their feet wet making games. And this one is about as blatant of knockoff of Namco's Family Stadium as you could get. The players all have the same proportions as the ones in Family Stadium, the controls are the same, the fielding's the same, there's only two significant differences in the features of Gonba League. First, all of the players have a condition, represented by a little face that appears while you're controlling them, and that affects how well they play. There's also weather effects on the game. You can see an arrow and a number telling you the wind direction and strength. But those are really the only differences here. The title is a small pun. It's basically Ganbare, or Go For It which isn't really a great pun, but it's pretty much the only thing the game has going for it. At least this is the last baseball game of the Super Famicom's first year. And since from now on I'm avoiding being a completionist, I hope it's also the last baseball game that I'll ever purchase. You wouldn't expect it from a game based on Shogi, but the Morita Shogi games were always on the cutting edge of video game technology. That probably came from its creator, the Morita of the title, being a computer science guy rather than a shogi guy. He took on the challenge of developing a shogi AI in the early 80s because it was an interesting problem, and he made the best playing shogi games that were available at the time. Shodan Morita shogi isn't as innovative as some of his other cartridges, like the one that had a modem built into it, but it took advantage of the 16-bit processing to really kick the AI up a bit. The AI in this game was so good that if a player could beat it on the highest difficulty, they were given a provisional ranking by the Japanese Shogi Association. Later Super Famicom releases in this series will include a 32-bit processor in the cartridge for even better AI. Shodan Morita Shogi may not be the most visually impressive game that we're going to see here, but it fills a vital niche and it's part of a historically important game series. Well, obviously there was going to be a tennis game. It's one of the earliest styles of video games, after all. Of course, this one's not exactly brought to us by a powerhouse. Tosei also developed Moero Pro Tennis for Jalico, and Super Tennis is almost exactly like that, both in its features and its faults. My biggest problem with Super Tennis is that I have a really hard time telling where the ball is. I keep missing swings because the perspective and the use of the shadow is just terrible here. The perspective is too low, so you're more dependent on the size of the ball and shadow to tell where it is, but they don't change significantly enough for you to be able to find the ball in space. Also annoying is that you stop dead when you swing the racket. You could be running at a full sprint, hit the button, and you just stop. Without momentum, the timing of your swings as you're moving feels unnatural. It's the first tennis game on the Super Famicom, so I'm sure it got some sales from that, but being first is the only thing that Super Tennis has going for it. I've seen people dismiss Hyperzone as an F-Zero knockoff, and it really isn't. It's a Galaxy Force knockoff. Hyperzone is a rail shooter that's very much in the mold of Sega's Super Scalar games. The Galaxy Force games in particular seem to be the closest comparison for me. In Hyperzone, you're on a narrow path, and if you fly outside of it, you take damage. You've only got two controls, shoot and break. The only beneficial thing for you on your route are recovery zones that will restore your shield as you fly over them. Good places to break. All you can really do is shoot the enemies, dodge the hazards, and stay on the path. The game is a technical marvel for 1991, but that came at a price. It also plays very slowly. It feels like everything should be moving about twice the speed that it does in the game. 
Your movements are sluggish and it's hard to dodge things. Hyper Zone is still a neat game. It's just that when you get hands-on with it, you can tell why it never caught on. This is the second game by Game Freak, after they made Quinty. And it feels like this is simultaneously something more traditional, since it is a platformer, but it still throws some unusual things at the player. The concept here is that the hero has been turned into a slime. And as a slime, he can do some unusual things, like squish down flat or stretch up tall, and doing those will let you attack enemies. You can also absorb balls that you can throw, and those are how you have to attack bosses. You can also stick to surfaces and climb up them. I happen to really like the level design in this game. The moon stage isn't complicated, for example, but it looks really cool. You can also change color and move really quick, which you have to do to make a lot of the jumps in this game. Obviously the title was supposed to be Jelly Boy, but the slime's name is Jerry, so it's probably an intentional pun? I know Jerry Boy doesn't look like much, but it's surprisingly fun to play. One of the hidden gems of the Super Famicom's first year. I hope you're ready for the most visually stunning game of the Super Famicom's first year. Can your heart stand the excitement of Super Son Goku Shi 2? Koei had actually already ported this to the Famicom about nine months before, and the Super version has a few very minor interface changes. It is still very much the same game, including the weird quirks of interface that Koei had, like how you enter numbers and have to hit left or right for yes and no, things that made more sense on a computer than a console system. The primary thing that Super Son Goku Shi 2 brings to the table is graphical improvements. This is still the game about building up your provinces, recruiting armies, and then using diplomacy or force to bring all of China under your rule. The Super Famicom winds up getting Son Goku Shi 3 and 4, so this is the version that you'd probably least want to play anyways. Now there's a title that's impossible to Google. I've played a lot of bad soccer games on the Famicom so far, and I was thinking at least the Super Famicom ones have to run more smoothly. Shows what I know. Let's start with the obvious one first. I'm used to soccer games having the pitch be way too small. The action scaled down to something that could easily fit onto a television screen for a game. Pro Soccer has the exact opposite problem. It feels like the pitch is three or four times larger than it should be. But weird scale of tiny men on a huge field aside, it's very difficult to keep the ball under control in this game. You can dribble in a straight line, but unless you are very careful about how you turn, you're going to just leave the ball behind when you go in another direction. And the AI is very foul happy in this game. Where are those red cards, ref? The best thing I have to say about Pro Soccer is that at least it's the last sports game of the Super Famicom's first year. For most of these clips, I've been trying to clear a stage or two before I record, so you're not just seeing the first level. But the music here is so iconic, I kinda had to go with it. Cho Makaimura was the first Makaimura game made specifically for a console. The previous two had started out as arcade games. However, it really is just an extension of Dai Makaimura, or Ghouls and Ghosts. In some ways, it does feel a little bit like a platformer from an era before this. The fixed jump distance in particular was something you rarely saw by 1991. But it feels like that kind of restricted jumping is built into the DNA of the series. So they kept it, but tweaked it slightly so that you could now double jump. It is possible to recover from a bad jump now. But it's also just as possible that you'll commit yourself to a bad jump when you do that double jump. One more quick thing of note here is that this is another one of the early Super Famicom games to demonstrate some really extreme slowdown during play. Everything just grinds to a halt at some points. That technical quirk aside, this is one of the better early action games on the Super Famicom. Super Earth Defense Force presents a weird conundrum. The other shoot-em-ups we've seen during the Super Famicom's first year have been more technically impressive. Big enemies, big environments, 
big power-ups, and they did that at the cost of grinding the game to a halt. Super EDF doesn't have a lot of detail, it just throws a ton of enemies at you and gives you your pick of eight weapons every time you start a level. So which is better, the simple game that's very well executed, or the ambitious game with one serious flaw? Well, whichever way it shakes out, this is a pretty fun shoot 'em up You've got pods that you can launch from your ship, weakening the weapon, but giving you more coverage, and your weapons level up with your score. The way that you power up is you play well. Shoot down a wave of enemies and you get bonus points. The game is just you versus waves of enemies until a boss shows up, so there isn't a whole lot here, but it is a pretty good time. A new platform means that it's a perfect time to reboot a game series. And what better day to release Akuma Joe Dracula than Halloween? Of course, that name is exactly the same as the game that was released on the Famicom Disk System, and then eventually have a Famicom release a few years after this. That really marks this as a remake of the original game. Of course, it's not exactly the same. Now half the game is the journey to the castle, which is where the original game began. And you're no longer limited to just whipping in front of you. You can whip in any cardinal or ordinal direction, or you could just let the whip go limp and flail it around in any direction you like. They've also added swinging on attachment points, and more Mode 7 gimmicks than you could shake a stick at. The movement's been loosened up as well. You're no longer locked into a specific arc when you hit the jump button which makes for a wider variety of platforming challenges. The vast levels and enormous set pieces really make this one astounding. It's remembered as a classic for a reason. On the anniversary of the Super Famicom's launch, Nintendo came back with their other big franchise. Of course, in 1990, the previous Zelda game had been five years before, Practically forever in game development time back then. I mean, that's nearly four Mega Man games ago. But Nintendo revived the series that had spawned countless imitators with one of the most important video games of all time. While it might just be an extension of the existing Zelda mechanics, adding more specialized tools and giving players a world that takes better advantage of them, it pushed those concepts further than anyone could have imagined. Nintendo treated the Zelda franchise as precious back in those days. It'll be seven years to the day before the next console release for the series. And in that time, this game is going to inspire an entire generation. You might be able to make an argument that Super Mario World was the more popular game from this period, but it's hard to say that there was a more important game than Zelda here. And that's the first year of the Super Famicom. 38 games may not seem like very many, especially when the original Famicom is getting over 150 a year. But in the second year, the number of Super Famicom releases leaps to 140, and it keeps going up from there. The Super Famicom winds up with about 400 more games for it, even with a shorter lifespan. Of the 38 games that we saw, there's only around a dozen that I'd consider to be games where you couldn't get anything like them on the Famicom. Obviously, for all of them, the graphics are better, there's more colors, and every one of them uses some kind of Mode 7 background distortion trick. But that's just the shine on top. There were a lot of games here that were just prettier versions of games you could already get. And that goes double for the baseball games. The Super Famicom was definitely in the teething stages, People weren't really sure how to apply all of that new power yet. The real biggest steps up were the games that took advantage of that extra memory. The original Famicom only offered 2 kilobytes of onboard RAM, and the Super Famicom expanded that to 128 kilobytes. Now the system could store an entire variable map in memory, and you could have things like Populous and SimCity. The Super Famicom games in that first year that really took advantage of the additional processing power are probably Draken and Haru Kanaru Augusta. While any processor could render a 3D scene given enough time, the kind of 3D rendering those games used just wouldn't be viable on the Famicom. Obviously, the games that integrate the Mode 7 effects into their basic gameplay really couldn't be done on the Famicom. 
you can make something like pilot wings or F-Zero, but not with the speed, flexibility, or free movement of those games. And then there are the games that take advantage of the Super Famicom's enhanced sprite capabilities. For me, Final Fight and Akuma Joe Dracula are the standouts there. So in this first year, the Super Famicom was already demonstrating itself to be more than just a graphical upgrade. It might have been late to the 16-bit party, but it carried the cachet of the Famicom name, and it gave people reasons to drop their old systems. Year 2 of the Super Famicom almost ties the number of releases between it and the Famicom. And then after that, the Famicom fades fast, while the Super Famicom becomes the dominant gaming platform in Japan. I doubt I'll dive deeper into its library than this, though. I've already spent two years of my life on the Famicom, and there's just too much Super Famicom. I'll leave fully documenting that library to someone else.